issues. A program that looks at the concerns of the people of Toronto. Here is the host of issues, Erwin Patterson. In all my travels around the world, I've always made it a point when I'm visiting a city to go and see their stadium and hockey arena. The stadiums that have fascinated me the most have been Dodger Stadium in Los Angeles, which is really a, a fabulous facility, and Chicago Stadium in Chicago, Illinois for hockey, mainly because it's elliptical and it has a couple of balconies. For many years, I always had an idea that we needed a stadium in the city and what it should look like. And I'm happy that the Sky Dome is pretty well what I would have done when it comes to basic design, such as three balconies, intimacy, a building able to handle conventions, baseball, football, and so on. But a year and a half ago, I accidentally bumped into the architect of the Sky Dome project and had a fantastic conversation, a conversation I'll never forget. And I'm going to try and recreate that tonight and we're going to talk a little bit about the Sky Dome and give you some insight, some of the things that are going on behind the scenes that you may not know about. How did it all get started and so on. I'd like you to meet Mr. Rod Robbie, the design architect for the Toronto Sky Dome, and along with Mike Allen, the patent and copyright holder of the design for the retractable roof stadium that has been used in the Toronto Sky Dome. Mr. Robbie, welcome to the program. Good evening. How did you get involved in this project? Um, well, it was, it was there. Um, I, uh, I first of all got involved by writing to Mayor Eggleton in May of 83 and asking if I could be considered. And, but it really got going in June of 84 when I joined up with Mike Allen and started to pursue the competition for it. So we, we got in because it was there. There were no invitations. Everybody else who went after the Sky Dome went after it in the same way. What was involved to become one of the four finalists? Uh, basically three competitions. Um, there were, first of all, a, a technical interview that reduced the field from uh, 30 or more to 11. And then there was a formal competition between 11 proponents. Uh, so Mike Allen and I went in with our, with our dome, as you see it. And that field was then reduced from 11 to 4. And then the 4, of course, was the final competition, which we, which we won, of course. How much time did it take you to prepare your proposal? Which one? <laughs> there were three of them. <laughs> um, well, you mean starting from the beginning? Starting from the beginning. Starting from, oh my goodness. It, it was thousands of hours of work. I, I've never actually figured it out, but uh, the first part, going from when we decided to start to, uh, to the, the first formal competition, took about six, seven months of intense work of trying to analyze this problem of how do you make a dome open. The second competition took around two, two and a half months, something like that, three months. And then the final competition took from about May of 85. We won it in December, and we finally were contracted in April of 86. So it took all that time. It's a very long and brutal process. <laughs> How much money did you have to invest personally in this risk to be able oh. to create your Mm -hmm. model yeah. to get into the fourth, the third competition against the other three. Well, it started out, the, the first round uh, was around $15,000 in that first competition. Second competition, it was around total $350,000 to me, $250,000 to my Allen, about $200,000 and more, my other partner, my other architectural partner. And then Ellis Don and Newbury put in their money, whatever they spent, which I don't, and H.H. H. Angus, our engineers, put in what they spent. We all put in our own money. But in my case, uh, my wife mortgaged her house and we spent the whole quarter million, so it's kind of suicidal. <laughs> From talking to you, I understand that the main problem was the roof because it had never oh, yeah. been done before. Yeah. And some of, some of the plans were drawn on a napkin and you went to restaurants and had lunch together. Can you take us through the roof, the complexities yeah. of it? Well, um, as I say, I started working in June of 84 with Michael and what we decided we had to do was to figure out how do you make a roof open? And bear in mind, everybody was saying they wanted a dome that would open. A dome can't be opened. It's geometrically impossible. We had to figure out a way of making the, the thing open as much as possible, but stay on its own footprint. 
And to do this, we basically set aside a day a week, which was 14 hours of that day, which was Thursday, typically. And then we'd work in between by ourselves and bring back that information. So that went on week after week, month after month. And we always, my offices were on Merton Street, and we used to have dinner at La Grola, which is a restaurant, a very good restaurant, still there, um, very busy. And we used to go there at lunchtime and at, at night and draw all over the tablecloths and whatever was on the table. But uh, essentially, the way it got invented was we went through this analytical process to, to define how do you make the thing open and, and what is the best way to, to design a baseball stadium and a football stadium and how should they relate. So, uh, for instance, as far as the stadium is concerned, there should be no seats in the north end. They're all bad seats for both games. It's good seats in the south end for baseball and not much good for football. Seats on the side for both games. So we'd already concluded that the stadium had to be circular because we could then move the field seats from one mode to the other. We didn't want any seats in the north end. We just wanted the scoreboard there and a few s outfield seats. And that the, 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 the roof in our original scheme, the roof was telescopic and it was square. And this didn't make too much sense because you had a square roof on a round building. So what we did, and we'd synthesized how it had to work. We'd figured out in our minds how it had to work, but we hadn't got the geometry. And the day that uh, um, Premier Davis uh, announced the selection of the, the site next to the tower, and it was finally selected, uh, Mike Allen, when he lives in Ottawa, went home on the plane and he sort of really worked at it on that plane and then in his kitchen table at home and came up with three drawings by the next day which he sent down to me on the bus. We used to communicate on the bus, whatever, parcel service. Excellent service. I can highly recommend it. whole competition was done using it. Um, that, we, uh, that he came up with this geometry of slicing up a dome, taking the middle out and having two parts, one that would nest on the other and and two pieces that slide back. So really what he managed to do was to synthesize two forms of telescoping, linear telescoping and rotating telescoping, or nesting as we've called it. So then after that, then the napkin story is very much the refinement, because what we then started to do was trying to refine the form. And I basically came up with a, a basic uh, scheme and I think uh, Dave Garrick's got the napkins because we still, yeah, he has them. Um, that uh, where we did a sketch to say we, we wanted this building to have a very distinct form so that when you saw it, you knew it was Toronto. Like the Sydney Opera House has a very distinct form. You know it's Sydney, Australia. Well, the same with this one. We wanted a very elegant shape, uh, a complex shape, facing a certain direction, facing south. So it's got a front and a back to it. Because most of the big domes, you can't tell where you are. You don't know whether you're looking from the north, south, east, or west. Whereas this one, it faces the lake. It faces the sun. So this was the, the napkin story, I think, is very much to do with the aesthetics. Because by then, we had, you know, I was just saying to him, I think it ought to look like this, you know, and, and with one of these big, thick pens, just drew it on the table napkin. So anyway. I think that's where that story came from. I've heard you say on television that the roof is basically railway technology. It isn't something that's new, that's never been done no, before, no. as far as the basic fundamental is concerned. Yeah. Well, essentially, well, rail, railway or crane or steelworks, it's much heavier than railway. But it, it's similar to, a, to a, you know, a crane in a, in a steel plant where they move the crucibles back and forth, these very large gantry cranes. It's similar to that. One of the things we, we set out to do, and this was fundamental to Mike Allen's engineering philosophy, that, uh, and also mine as the architect, that we did not want to reinvent the wheel. We did not want to, to use kind of space age, age ideas simply for their own sake. In other words, we concluded that making this roof move was far and away a difficult enough problem. It, you know, it is an awesome problem because buildings shouldn't move. If buildings start moving, you leave them real fast. You know, now, so we were going against all the rules of building and having this very large element moving. So that was going to create a unique set of problems. So we said, 
let's just deal with that problem and everything else should be well known. So we went for uh, parabolic arches, uh, a framed roof, not a space frame, which had a lot of redundancy in it so that you could have the roof damaged in various places and it, it would not transfer a load all over the place in a, in a disastrous way. So it could take a lot of damage. Um, and because <coughs> this roof has to last a very long time. You know, the life of the building is 100 years. So we went for tubular construction, which is well known, using square tubes. Um, corrugated steel deck, no fancy, you know, see-through finishes or anything like that. It was a very simple, straightforward building. But the, the, the artistry, in, from an engineering point of view, is in making it move and do all these other things that it does. Did you visit other stadiums to get some ideas? Yeah. Well, I think, as I've said to other people, that neither Mike or I had ever been to a baseball game before we entered this competition. He'd been to a lot of football games. I'd been to two. So we had to learn, and which, which was very good. I mean, this is like, you know, in my other rest of my life, I, I designed life science labs and complex laboratories and food processing plants that, that in these instances, we, we go to the owner or their representatives and we find out what it is they want to do in detail. So we did the same with this. We went, first of all, met with Alison Gordon, who was a long-standing sports writer, um, been to thousands of baseball games, and asked her, like, tell us about baseball. What is baseball? Like, what is the ambience? What, what do people want to do when they go to a baseball game? Like, tell us, the, you know, the theory and the mystique and, and the, the practicalities of the game and its audience participation and so on. So then from her, she suggested certain stadiums that she thought were worth seeing. And we tried to go to as many of these as, as we could afford to go to, um, both in terms of time and money. But we felt that, that she had already told us and other people that we talked to, you know, associated with the, with the game um, and with football, that the things that they wanted to see done. And, you know, one of the problems of going and looking at other buildings can be you start repeating other people's mistakes. And so we had to go and at least have enough critical faculty before we looked at these buildings to say, well, yeah, that bears out what we're told, so this must be a good place to look at baseball. Like, for instance, Royal Stadium clearly was a good place to go and watch baseball. In Kansas City. In Kansas City, yeah. And Dodgers, as you said, was another good place to go and watch baseball. Dodgers and Stadium in Los Angeles. Yeah. Now, some of the, you know, the newer covered stadiums we didn't think were particularly good places to watch either baseball or football. Of the stadiums that you looked at, what did you see that you didn't like? Well, I think that primarily, primarily it wasn't so much that you know, you can, any architect can go in and criticize other people's work, which is an easy thing to do. But I think it was more to do with functional requirements. And I think that these probably came out of what they were, the designers were told to do, not so much as that they told the owners what to do, but for instance, all of the newer air uh, stadiums with air supported roofs appeared to consist of a band of seating going all the way around a field evenly, you know, so they were like basically the same width wherever you were. And we had been told quite categorically by, by the people running the professional sports teams and the players and, and, and fans and everybody else that. In football, people wanted to sit between the goal lines. They didn't want to sit in the end zones. And in baseball, they wanted to sit hopefully behind home plate or certainly between first and third, and certainly not beyond the foul poles. So this very clearly, you know, you had one sport had a group of seats that went like that. And this is a north-south line, and this is north or northeast up here. It's in north anyway. And in football, you had a rectangular field with two blocks of seating a north-south axis. So these two, if you laid them on top of each other, you suddenly realize that all those seats that basically went from the goal line or the foul pole around the north end were all bad seats. So why put them in? So this is, we were surprised to find how many of these big new stadia had, you know, literally thousands upon thousands of seats in areas that weren't very good. And we said, well, there must be other uses that could go in there. Uh, and why not put them there? Did you talk to any athletes? 
very few. They're very hard to get to. I mean, if you see, bear in mind, we were not well known, and we, like, we we were trying to uh, sort of work our way in from from the outside. So we 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 spoke to a few, but typically we spoke to coaches and and managers and the press, a fair amount to the <coughs> press. Now I'm not gonna. I know you don't want to criticize the other three in the competition that didn't win, and I'm not going to criticize, but I'm going to offer some comments. I think I know enough about stadiums from a tourist as well as from a sports fan. I know what I want and what I don't want. In Maple Leaf Gardens, there's really no balcony on the sides. It's just one section of seats going up behind another. Right. And balconies in the old Madison Square Garden, which doesn't exist now, the balconies are one on top of another. Mm -hmm. People in the top balcony stand or sit in the rafters to see what's below because the balcony below is hindering their view. Mm -hmm. So I don't want balconies here. And I don't want balconies like this. Mm. Now, the, the top picture shows, and you don't have to come in on this. We'll, we'll zoom in on this later. The top picture shows one balcony behind another, which I didn't mm. like. Mm -hmm. The bottom picture shows an elliptical building, which mm. isn't going to be I think you could make the comment, though, that this, this arrangement um, is very much the arrangement that um, uh, many new stadia have used. I mean, BC places like that. And, and also and Baltimore. I think, yeah. Baltimore, yeah, and I think also that that the other, you know, the mitigating reason for doing this, as I understand it, was there was a lot of concern about shadow. Yes. You know, that if you if the balconies overhang, they obviously will cast shadows. Yankee Stadium. Yeah. Okay. In this one, I don't like the fact that the balconies are so far back from one another that you're taking fans farther away. I would have liked mm. to see them hang more over the mm. balcony below. But look at your dome at oh, the yeah. bottom. You've yeah. got three or four levels of seats, and they're not so close to one another that you can't see below, and they're not so far behind one another that they're not balconies. No. I think there was another, you know, just thinking back, because that photograph you got there is of the original model. Um, we, we did, we started in June of 84 on a seating study. Again, seeing that we didn't know anything about it, we just asked people what they wanted, and they said, we want to be as near the action as possible. So we, we wrote a lot of computer programs to try and figure out how to f force the seating as close <coughs> to the action as possible. And this is how we got this shape, by, by mathematical analysis. My favorite stadium is Dodger Stadium. And as you can see, the, the balconies are mm. set back in a proper proportion. Yeah. And when you look at it from, a, from straight above, you can see a good look at how the balconies are properly right. proportionally yeah. placed. And they also have a stadium club in here, which I believe you're going to have in your stadium. Oh, yeah. With yeah. people being able to sit, eat, yeah. and look out and watch the game. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we have at the north end, there's a 600, I think it's now 800 seat restaurant, um, which is uh, immediately above the end, end zone seats. So there's, there's seating in that end, about 2,800 seats. And immediately above it is this large restaurant. And it's very very high steps you know the steps are like five feet so that the table you, the four people sitting at a table the people on the next table can see right over them to the field so you'll better sit and have dinner and watch the whole action taking place i know of a facility in this city when it was being built the main tenant went to the architects and said these are the things we would like you to give us to make it easier for us to work dressing rooms etc etc mm. practice rooms when the stadium was finished, the architects gave the tenant, the main tenant, almost none of what he asked for. It's considered a pretty good building for the audience and a pretty poor building for the tenant. Mm -hmm. What have you done in research, and I understand you have talked to the baseball and the football team, I want you to describe how you have put together this stadium so that it's going to be good for the two main tenants. And I'm thinking mm -hmm. of the mound, which has to be moved. Yeah. So you can have football and conventions and then mm. put it back for baseball. Yeah. Batting tunnels, bullpens. Where do baseball teams want bullpens? Where do they want the dugouts? How big yeah. should they be? What did you do in your research, okay. which I know has been this, well done? Yeah, this is, the Stadium Corporation have done an extremely intense study. It's, uh, they hired a firm, Brisbane, Brook, Bain, and Architects, and three firms of engineers to write a program for them. And these people concentrated on just setting down the requirements, and they interviewed, so they did this very complex interview 
which produced a program for, uh, for the competition, for the final competition. We, in our turn, were doing comparable research, and not, on the same, not to the same degree, simply because it was already done, and we were concentrating on interpreting it into a design and making it all work. Um, but what we've done since then, so that was during the competition period, uh, what we've done since then is long, long meetings, uh, our, not me personally, but my staff and, and other people in the design construction team have met with the Blue Jays, they've met with the Argos, um, to work in detail through their requirements. You know, I mean in minuscule detail. Uh, things like the, the, the mound, I mean, this building has to be able to convert to um, exhibition use quickly. The mound is, is hydro it's, it sits in a pond and it, it, it floats up and down by water pressure to its required height. And, uh, there's a similar mound at the Anaheim Stadium uh, where it was done first and it, you know, it's a very workable solution. Uh, the same with the, uh, with the bases and so on, that everything is designed so that we can remove them, cover them up, the, the dugout's the same, are removable, uh, have been designed again with, uh, you know, close cooperation with the Blue Jays, and then so on through the rest of the piece. Like on the exhibition work, uh, there was um, meetings held with exhibitors to find out, you know, what they wanted, um, and other uses. Like we, we have designed the building to be a very good venue for concerts. See, one of the things to remember is that. You know, we have 365 days in the year. Professional sports will take 100, which leaves, you know, 260 days. Um, and so the, the stadium is going to be, in one of its manifestations, will be baseball, another will be football. Those were the two prime users and the reason why it was originally created. The other major user will be trade shows and exhibitions. And then in between, uh, musical and other concerts and all sorts of other events. I mean, there's a wide variety of events. So we've tried to make it, um, when it's in its different forms, is a very good place to go. I mean, so if, you, if you're only in interested in exhibitions, you'd know it as a very good exhibition place, not know that it was a baseball stadium. If you were doing this project again and you could have one wish, what would it be? A little bit more land, a little bit more. Not a lot, just a little, like 100 feet in each direction <laughs> would make a heck of a difference. <coughs> You've been involved in other projects, such as the new town of Frobisher Bay, the Ward Air wide-body aircraft hangar, the Sky Dome and the hotel, and there's a hotel involved there, and the National Identity Central Computer System for Saudi Arabia. So you've put together, I understand, about 1,300 projects in your lifetime as an architect. Yeah, that's right. Not, now, you know, I I've been principal of a number of firms, you know, I've, since I was, well, th for the past 30 years, I've been a head of, you know, principal of a firm. So. You know, I, d I obviously haven't drawn every line on those projects, but I have been involved in the, in the decision-making in terms of what they're like. And, and uh, when I was younger, of course, I did a very large amount of the work as well, you know, the, the drawing work. Is the Sky Dome your biggest thrill as an architect? No, I think, uh, I think we talked about this once before. Actually, the biggest thrill was the Canadian Pavilion at Expo 67 because now, this is staggering. I mean, I don't want to detract from the I fact understand. this is an amazing, amazing project to be involved in. But that project was emotionally overwhelming almost because I've been in Canada as an immigrant seven years, and my partners and I won, the, won a competition for that, that uh, job, which was worse than this competition because there were 60 firms of architects involved. And in the end, we beat the, the two most prominent firms in the country to win it. And it was, let's face it, it was the, the national shrine. It was the, the symbol of the country's first hundredth birthday. And it was, to me as a new Canadian, it was an incredible honor to be given this job to do. I mean, the, the British and the, and the Europeans certainly didn't do the same thing in their countries, you know. Where did the idea of an inverted pyramid and a tree come from? Um, the the people tree, uh, we, we wanted something where we could collect up symbols of everyday life in Canada uh, and put them all together, you know. And uh, we did, uh, you know, as you see there, that uh, orange structure was the people tree. 
and the idea was that you should better walk up through it, and there you see it in the foreground, walk up through it and look at pictures of people that are just ordinary Canadians. And so it was and it was an interesting thing to do, but it was also an emotional thing. The the pyramid um, we were trying to represent Canada with this building. This, this was an exhibition building. It wasn't a permanent building. These two projects are, are similar in size, except, of course, the Sky Dome is much bigger. They, funnily enough, the sites were about the same area. But the idea was that Canada was a country seeking unity through its diversity. It was not a melting pot. One of the clear differences between Canada and the United States, and hopefully always will be, is that Canada is a mosaic and not a melting pot. And that we felt that the pyramid is the symbol of utter stability. A, a pyramid as a building structure, symbolically nothing can ever move or change. And we figured that you should take this symbol of stability and invert it and say, you know, we, we have in this country, uh, we are carrying out a very delicate balancing act. Now, there's always this between the two founding uh, f founding uh, nations, of the, the, the French and the French speaking and the English speaking Canadians. But then there are all the other people who've come since. And together we're trying to make a, a unique new nation, new kind of nation. It's like the prototype of the world. I mean, if Canada works, there's a hope that the whole world could work because people in Canada still retain their cultures and they go together. So we try to symbolize this in this pavilion. And so, in, in essence, we wanted to represent the great land. If you remember, the site was all covered in brick all the way through the whole thing. And the sky, the enormous sky, was a, this translucent structure. And then this symbolic okay. artifact in the middle. We've only got a few seconds left. Right. Is it going to be possible to play hockey in the Sky Dome? You could do it, but I don't think it's going to be a good venue, personally, because the, the seating arrangement, that you can't get your... Your, the, the ice surface close up to the, <coughs> to the seats, which is where they should be. And if, uh, you know, I think you'd have sight line problems. You could, certainly, you could certainly do it, and we've shown it on our drawings that you can put it in. We have no ice making equipment in there. There are no pipes under the concrete or anything, but they can do anything. <laughs> Mr. Robbie, I know you are an incredibly busy man, and I'm really happy that you came down here Thank and you. talked to us today. And I'm sure the viewers are going to enjoy listening to this show a number of times because you've given us a lot of insight into your project. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming out. Thank, Thank you for you. watching. Good night. Tonight's edition of Issues is being brought to you in part by Vesuvio's Pizza, the original award-winning pizza takeout serving the West Toronto Junction Triangle area since 1957. Call Vesuvio's Pizza today at 763-4191.